Hello. What we're going to do is talk a little bit here in this kind of asynchronous environment about some of the key adaptations that have resulted in arthropod success in order that we can focus on those arthropods that are successful when we're together in the lecture. So where we left off on Wednesday talking about panarthropoda was talking about segmented um, or jointed appendages, segmental appendages. And I emphasize the fact that these can be for respiration, uh, for mobility, all sorts of, they can be uniramus, biramus. So let's talk a little bit about the jointed articulated legs that have really resulted in the arthropods being successful. And one of the secrets of their success, jointed legs. Scan the QR Legs which can bend about a hinged joint provide great stability and shock absorption. Perfect features for an all-terrain vehicle. With their many joints, each leg has tremendous flexibility. Tendons attached to powerful muscles produce a range of motion So this articulation across the legs is is really when we say I say up in the title here arthropods are all legs this is this is all about stability conservation of energy and about uh, really related to their success so and there's a couple of different diagrams here so in chapter uh, 20 we're looking at uh, figure three and then the upper one is from the older text the Rupert Fox and Barnes so the articles when we talk about articulated legs the articles are the hard part of that appendage and I avoid or try to avoid not always successful calling them segments to keep that kind of developmentally and conceptually separate from thinking about metameric segmentation this kind of ordered replication of units across the length of the body so these are uh, antagonistic we've talked a little bit about flexors and extensors these um, uh, muscles that can where where they are jointed and we talked a little last time um, together we talked about protractor and retractor muscles flexors and extensors are kind of across where they are which part of the articles that they're joining to is it on the inside of the the elbow or the outside um, so walking swimming flight in some groups um, and the strength here strength literally and conceptually is is the in the pairing of the antagonistic muscle pairs across the articulated joint. So we see here in the top, we've got the epicuticle. Remember the epicuticle, that's like the fatty water uh, layer. That's on the left-hand side, water loss layer. Um, then across the cuticle, the epidermal cells and the muscle fibers, you can see here the real um, connections between the cuticle across the epidermal cells to the muscle fibers. And so real intimate connection uh, provided to uh, the hard parts, the articles and the muscles that are firing across them. So there's the extensor and the flexor. Uh, there's a look in chapter, uh, remember chapter four in your text, it's not about the restricted to a particular taxon, it's about principles of things. And this is, uh, and I mentioned uh, throughout the course that you'll keep going back to chapter four. Here it is. Here's us later on in chapter 20 taxonomically, but going back to chapter four to look at this articulating membrane across the flexor and the extensor muscles. So um, the muscles are attached clearly on the inside of the skeleton and then coordinated. Remember, cephalized things. So this is a little view of a gorgeous um, millipede on the forest floor in Costa Rica where I work. And I just love the wave-like action of of these articulated legs kind of going from front to back on the body. There's an enormous amount of stability. The last video made reference to that and I think we should expand that in terms of w w advantageously why is this articulated leg so important. The ease with which they move about the world is clearly a key factor in their success. You love that stash. Full probes the reasons why they are so good at traversing the earth. Really, I'm interested in their movement, so you can discover the secrets of how their muscles and their skeletons work to allow them to move so wonderfully in the environment. So, he's got little treadmills. Arth and he places his arthropods on these treadmills. In general, like a tripod or a stool. Three legs are on the ground at once. 
and as a result, they're incredibly stable. Yet most arthropods need to move extremely fast. Full discovered that speed is possible because their walk doesn't require much brain power. We typically think that, that control of uh, robotics and, and about how the ro robotics industry and kind of design uh, and design based in bio-inspired design engineers would be interested in that uh, for uh, aiding in, in robotics, the robotics of small things uh, that can be mobile without requiring a lot of brain or CPU power. So let's move from the legs a little bit to talk in general. We're talking about in general arthropod things here about circulation and gas exchange. Remember, this is an open circulatory system that where the hemostyle kind of bathes things. So the pathway uh, would basically is traced there in the second bullet from the heart to the arteries to the hemocils to some collecting vessels, a pericardial sinus, an ostia, boom, into the heart and out again. Now, trachea in insects, we mentioned trachea uh, when we were talking about uh, the use of ectozoan and the kind of the stress that comes from molting. The trachea is kind of an amazing thing because it is the tubular invagination of the epidermis and the cuticle. And that's why it's kind of still involved in molting because if you're going to molt, uh, you're not just molting the protective exoskeleton, you're molting your lungs. Um, the trachea is what delivers oxygen to individual cells. So from the uh, spiracle here on the center, which is embedded in the cuticle, that's the opening to the external environment, we trace this through to the trachea, into the tracheoles that then kind of branch off into individual muscle cells. On the underside of its body begins a series of reinforced tubes adapted from the exoskeleton itself. These tubes open directly to the outside air and draw oxygen into their bodies. A similar type of turbocharged system would play a key role in future arthropod conquests. So we've talked about this before in terms of trachea, tracheals, and that, and that um, there's nothing um, that ultimately means we're relying on, or they are relying on diffusion. Remember way back when we talked about scale and why you wouldn't need to be uh, scared of giant ants or giant insects in general, and that's because they would suffocate if they were scaled up that scaled up, this tracheal system doesn't work. And interestingly, when we see giant insects in the fossil record, it's coincident with much higher concentrations of oxygen in the ambient, uh, in the ambient world. So the digestive system, which we've kind of made some reference to because of this kind of amazing part here, uh, but let's start at the anterior end. So this is dissected out. That's the mouth, uh, which is derived from the ectoderm. Uh, which is about, in general, in arthropod storage and maceration, uh, initiating digestion. Then we have the hindgut uh, at the right-hand side of the slide, which is also derived from the ectoderm, which is largely about reclaiming water and salts, uh, efficiency. And then the midgut uh, here, which is not derived from the same, uh, it's derived from the endoderm, and that's where most digestion and absorption comes from. So the fore and the hind gut are ectoderm, and they're lined by cuticle and epidermis, and the midgut has a gastrodermis, but no cuticle. Now the malpighian tubules, these kind of little bits of spaghetti that are right here, that branch off from the joint between the intestine and the midgut, they're kind of amazing. And we've seen them, I made mention of them uh, for other taxa where we've seen them kind of emerge um, from an evolution, a, a convergent or an independent evolutionary perspective. They seem to be a, where we see them, they are a terrestrial adaptation to reducing water loss and waste. So these are these blind endodiverticula of the gut that are located like there in between the, the midgut and the intestine. And so the tissues are secreting guanine into the blood. And this is absorbed by the blood from uh, the malpighian tubules. And then the gut lumen lowers the pH in the precipitates of the um, of the waste that is then transferred into the out the anus as feces. So the malpighian tubules move to maintain this kind of concentration gradient that allows this uh, italicized bullet to actually take place so that the final product is uh, guanine. And it's evolved multiple times uh, in the arthropods, uh, insects, arachnids, and myriapods. So there's your blind diverticula, the malpighian tubules.
Now, a number of times I've already made mention of the fact that these are a uh, high degree of cephalization, lots and lots of nervous system adaptations here. So a three-part brain is one way to think about it. This is a blow up of kind of the anterior segments of the, just behind the acron of the head, where we have the protocerebrum, the deutocerebrum, and the tritocerebrum. Um, so, and it's spread across, uh, the proto is in the acron, the deutocerebrum is in the head, uh, and it's a, responsible for sensory and motor nerves, and then the tritocerebrum is in the second head segment, or in some cases, the second antennal uh, segment, if you're uh, a chalicerate or an arachnid. So the different locations of these, um, you can look at in terms of their, their homology, how, how they're used di differently in different lineages here by kind of looking. So we've got the, uh, the non-monophyletic crustaceans, myriapods and hexapods, uh, the sea spiders, and then the true chalicerates here to look at the distribution of the proto, the deuto, and the tritocerebrums across these, the acron or the second or tertiary segments in the head. Now, when I think inevitably, when we're thinking about arthropods, there's a bias to thinking about insects. When I think about insects, one of the things that I think about immediately because they're so gorgeous are their eyes. This is a fly that lives in the leaf litter in Costa Rica. It's a male fly of an undescribed species. I know it's undescribed because the uh, kind of preeminent fly biologist of, of much of the world, who used to is an emeritus professor here, Dr. Steve Marshall, looked at the fly and said, yeah, I know that's of this genus from this subfamily, and it is a it does not have a name. And we know it's a male because of this aspect of the compound eye, where the individual members of the compound eye almost have like a, um, a bifocular lens. And that's because members of this uh, family of flies, the males tend to do kind of dances for the females in the air. And so their perception of 3D space is really important. Now, the eyes or the photoreception of insects and arthropods has some amazing things that we see compound eyes, like these giant globes here, comprised of multiple omatidia. But then we also see what looks like this little creature in a gas mask, the, the three, this triangle of what are called simple eyes or uh, median acelli. And so different eyes for different things, different forms. If there are, remember we talked about the number of species there of, of, of insects, this is an insect. And so it could be, there might be as few as a million and there might be as many as hundreds of millions and differences in structure and form in their eyes is, is just spread across all of this uh, diverse, diverse group. So eyes can be sessile or stalked. Uh, one of the things that's pretty cool, so sessile, so like embed right close to the body, or stalked as more of this fly's eyes are here. The focus uh, can't be varied, which is kind of interesting as a difference to our own. Um, and so in a compound eye as this fly, so if we blow up these uh, take a cross section of the eye and we look at an individual omatidium. That's this little dagger that's being drawn out of the compound eye. And we see, and there's a cross section of it here. We see that there is a lens and a cone and then light receptive pigment cells, the repotum and the retinal cells that you can see in this flower shape in the cross section. So the, tra the, the lens and the crystalline cone in which it all sits uh, and then the light sensitive visual and pigment cells. So an Omatidia, uh, many omatidia, a single omatidium, many omatidia make up the compound eye. Each one focuses light and has pigments or opsins for different, uh, different colors, different wavelengths. The image is projected right side up, which is kind of, again, unlike our own eyes. And then insects like this large fly, or the, the fly with the big eyes that I showed you, it's actually a small fly, um, practically have a 360 uh, degree panoramic view of the world and don't have to turn their head to get a sense of their environment in any real direction. So the this orange, the rabidome here, this is the mass of microbilly that belong the, to the cells in the, the where there's the highest density um, of the rhodopsin uh, of some of the pigments, uh, the color sensing pigments. So there can, these uh, compound eyes can be uh, constructed in slightly different ways. You can have superposition or A position. That's left and right here. So uh, the superposition compound eye is modified to collect and concentrate light 
um, from more than one omatidium, so a, low, a species that's active at low uh, light levels. And then when there's no cone uh, stock and the cone cells are close to the rhabdome, the light entering the cells is, um, that's the uh, eight position compound dye. And if you have been exposed to Gary Larson um, and the Fireside uh, indirectly, this cartoon might be a, fa it was relatively famous, it, it might be something you've come across, but it's, it propagates a myth of, co of multiple images in a compound dye. The better way to think of this is that, so this, the, the idea here is that this is the fly is going to be swatted and each individual omatidia has its own image of that uh, person that's carrying the fly swatter. The better way to think about those omatidia is to think about your television. And so that the composite of all of the motidia is a mosaic image. So think about the number of omatidia as akin to pixels in a television screen and greater resolution uh, from the screen that has greater the number of pixels. And some species of dragonfly can have more than 30,000. So instead of thinking about, so there you've got like high resolution and lower resolution. And this is a robber fly. This is another video of mine from a forest in Costa Rica. And I love, this is a fly. This is a highly visual hawking fly. You can see slightly stocked eyes, great big compound eyes with some medium acelli as the wind kind of moves it around as it's sitting and waiting for her to find another fly that it can hawk and pierce. And there's a really neat study that was published a few years ago that looked at exactly how robber flies catch their flies. So there's one pre-catch and there's another fly the robber fly on the right hand side eating its prey item. And in the supplementary appendix of this paper, so they look, they made the fly, here comes the robber fly that's going to track this little bead that's moving across. And so the human, the person blinking their eyes just to give you a sense of how much, how fast this is happening, that it's happening very, very rapidly. And what they're showing you is that that fly with its little tiny brain is actually orienting, it's changing its developmental or its, its direction of, of, of um, momentum in response to the prey item. So that's usually a signature of a much bigger, larger, more neurocomplex animal, like vertebrates, like dogs even. So this is like the same kind of thing is happening when you see these amazingly attentive border collies chasing after frisbees in the air. They're modifying their direction of attack based on the speed of the thing that they're kind of trying to prey upon. So this particular species of robber fly captures prey with changing by maintaining a constant bearing angle. So this angle on the inside is modified by the speed of the fly in response to it observing the speed of the prey that it wants to catch, which is kind of amazing based on the fact that the brain is smaller than not just the head of a pin, but often like the point of the pin kind of amazing. So we in our species have three options, red, green, and blue, and we can see millions of colors with those combinations. Increase your options, you have an increased number of colors the way that you can see the world. Some arthropods have 30 cop options, which means trillions of colors. So these um, deer flies from the Ottawa Valley can see colors that we can't imagine. I think that's safe to say that's literally true. This dragonfly could see colors that we can't possibly imagine. I love taking a look at this. This is a species of dragonfly from the Ottawa Valley that was dead and we imaged it with our phone and, and I just call attention to the fact that you've got these tools in your pockets all the time because the person that imaged this dragonfly eye and these omatidia, these thousands of thousands of, of, of individual omatidia, wasn't me, it was my niece when she was this old with this kind of technology. So up to 30,000 omatidia in odinate or dragonfly in their relatives' eyes. 33 options, different wavelengths, and so you have the capacity to see, if you look at this, so there's a small phylogeny of different taxa here of dragonflies, and you can see the expressions of, of what bits of, of uh, radiation they can actually see. So all of them seem to be able to see ultraviolet radiation, short wave, long, and different wavelengths of short and long, all across the visual spectrum. So, kind of amazing. Um, yeah, I hope you continue to share your enthusiasm, my enthusiasm, our enthusiasm of finding out about these arthropods where we'll stay in this course for the next few weeks before we head on to the deuterostomes. And uh, take care, be kind, and be enthusiastic about invertebrates.